Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Dia's Readings and Contemporary Poetry Series. My name is Megan Whitco, and I am an assistant curator here at Dia, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Um, we're very pleased to have our two poets joining us this evening, uh, Stephen Seidenberg and Alan Felsenthal. Thank you both for joining us tonight, and Stephen, thank you for coming out from California. Uh, so, Readings in Contemporary Poetry is a part of the Sackler Institute at Dia Art Foundation, and we want to particularly thank uh, the Levy Gorvey Gallery, who provides major support for this series. And additional support is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as our media sponsor, the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, we also want to thank Brooklyn Brewery for the cold beverages, uh, and all of Dia's staff who help uh, coordinate the series, particularly Mary Catherine Youngblood and Max Tanone. Uh, so just a quick housekeeping announcement. Uh, if anybody's a regular here, I see some familiar faces. Uh, we will not be doing an intermission this evening and following the readings, that will be a perfect opportunity to purchase books uh, by both of our poets, as well as um, you're welcome to stay and chat and grab another beer uh, if you'd like. So, um, Without any further ado, I am going to hand things over to Vincent Katz, who is the curator of our Readings and Contemporary Poetry series, and he will introduce the first reader for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming out tonight. This is our penultimate reading of the season, and I'm very excited for it. Our last reading, this year, the season, will be on May 15th, and it will be Maxine Chernoff and Emily Skillings, so please come back for that one. Um, our first reader tonight will be Steven Seidenberg. Steven Seidenberg's recent publications include Itch, published by Raw Art Press in 2014, Null Set, from Spooky Action Books, 2015, and Situ from Black Sunlit this year, as well as numerous chapbooks of verse and aphorism. He co-edits Palaksh Palaksh, published by Instance Press, an occasional journal of experimental poetry, and he organizes poetry events at the lab in San Francisco. Seidenberg's photo collections include Pipe Valve Berlin, published by Lodima Press in 2017. Steven Seidenberg has published prose works that verge on speculative philosophy. I'm intrigued by how he shifts from those expansive modes to a poetry that is so focused on specific points, glints of sound and meaning that strike the reader's mind and listener's ear with a strange familiarity. I love how he rhymes scrape and crepe in the lines, pushed through the noisome tallow of the scum and scrape, the scum and squall of lunar husk undreamed from crepe of wanton gash and startled river. There's a lot of erudition in Seidenberg's poetry, a lot of wisdom too but a lot of it passes by so fast, almost too fast to capture. You have to be on your toes. And then something else happens. The whole, the entirety of the poem, projects from sharply evinced details a wider picture that gathers an unspecified social and historical relevance. Seidenberg's poetry seems to sail across the centuries, gleaning usages from Old and Middle English while keeping the snap of contemporary poetic modes. It is, it is in the precision of his language, I believe, and the strangeness of the world it conjures that Seidenberg's rhythms and sounds can best lead us to insight. Please welcome Steven Seidenberg. Thank you, Vincent, and Alan, and Megan. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks everyone from, for coming out tonight. Um, so I'm going to read from this new book of mine called Situ from Black Sunlit, uh, which is one of those works of 
speculative philosophy or prose or poetry or something like that, a kind of hybrid form that um, moves in and out of those different registers. I'm just going to read from the beginning and straight through till my time is up. But that's not all. This seat, his seat, has never been another's, has always only been dispensed to find his occupancy near, to suit his nearing occupation, if not the present circumstance of being thereby occupied, of being set upon by only him, by him alone. This is to say that as he turns his gaze back to his harbor, no matter what corrosive goad provoked him to dethrone, the cardinal intimation that his pulp should find no lading on that ramshackle recliner leaves him hardly in existence, hardly corrigibly extant, a manifold of carrion both drifting past and soon to come, and soon to spoil here. Surely it has happened before, he thinks. He has left his bench before many times, countless times, which does nothing to prevent him from attempting such a count, an assay that's near equal to the feint of its achievement, or at least when it's considered from the outside, the outside of the outside, nearly the inside, but not quite, not yet. He still knows the difference, knows the difference is all difference, every difference held in state, both in and out, in state and kind. There was that one occasion, just the other day, he can almost feel the weight of the sun on his back. It was the last sun, the last time there was a sun that the weight of the back of the sun was. He can almost taste it. That's what they say. That's what they say they say, he thinks. That one can almost taste it when one thinks that one can taste it. But that's not right. Not quite his right, if nothing less obscure. He thinks that if he manages to disregard all other sense, the less of it, the more of it, he thinks it could be all, then he can nearly cast himself back into that last Phoebus, perhaps the brightest double yet to simper through the burnished vault, the vaulting bar. Just the other day, the other day when he had, for example, left his bench for nothing less than the necessity of leaving his bench, and nothing more perhaps, again perhaps, perhaps again, for nothing more or less than the necessity of leaving his bench, an urgency made manifest by nothing more or less than the perplexed and blushing affect of his calentured cheek, his lips adrift from gums in pained, retraction from the glossa and the next ostensive centering of everything that centers on a muscular convulsion of the egress of the split. But no, he thinks, not yet or not again, he'd rather vow. It's always best when yet is made indifferent to again, when one can't tell the difference, when the difference is indifferent and yet again is again yet, Always when what has not happened nonetheless rescinds its done opprobrium of losses and returns that fevered omphalus to some intrinsic innocence of gusts. Perhaps it was the wind made spit to transpierce his latissimus, perhaps his mast fit witless to the porch of his arrival, but it's so he sees. He sees it so. For once he can attend the rule, and this time, just this once, not merely sharp his eager focus on the absence of a speaker, of a speaker spoken to by speaking out. There was a sun the other day. He felt its weight upon his back. But even in the living of that moment, he still failed to think, still rightly failed to think that mass, an attribute of anything but his deferred reception, of his 
burden in its hauling, a fantasy of ballast that seemed sweet as it reached tongue. If he cannot taste it, he cannot bear it, an endless source of trouble in his commerce on the boulevard. However, one can say that he has bought or sold his wares. If he cannot taste it, it is not his, this foundling glimpse, but everything that's in it is imputable to him. He cannot think this protean reduction of the scene to some assemblage of distrait associations, of surrenders of the outside to some intimated core. Accordingly, a predicate of his peculiar potency, his binding resignation to a boundless drive, a softening dray. But who is really able to make such returnless venture allege a confirmation to a vision of achievement? So a practice in the slightest way compelled, an odd rhetorical, who's to say anything, to speak anyway. Thus accepting his unknowing, if unknowable acceptance, of a world that's not on offer but is taken up by force, the sense of sensibilities not understood as sensate allows a nearer vision of his present paralypsis, of what he thinks a vestige of his minderless lookout. Nearer is not inside, it may be, but there's the triumph. To be inside would be equal to a positure bemused. If it's inside that you're after, then it's inside thus revealing his acceptance of a world he thinks as given, a world he's since received, he's since aroused, if still too soon. He thinks back to the last son, the only son he's managed to think back to as a likeness. But still he can't lay claim to having ever claimed it present, so to hear fulfill his promise, his next promise to the absent. How else could one model such an aftermath of voices? How return one's thinking to a day so long ago, so long past, return such empty savor to the trick of having passed? Why not here allow this indiscretion, this offensive to take one no less willingly than bound towards such presentiment, towards some resolve that's set before the passions of the scene to come. To come, it is to come, he thinks, but that is not his present purpose, nor is it. The last son, the only son, the only is the last son, and that passed long or short ago, whenever it played out within his inn, it doesn't matter. Whether it matters or not, that is to say, he knows it can't be known if for no other reason than the fact that such a standard is precisely what's gone missing since it happened, since it last appeared. Without this subjugation to the discrepating shadows, some atmospheric median to measure up against, he knows that he can't hope to frame the passage of the hours, and without the passing hours, his days appear a nearly insurmountable expanse. Perhaps he can hope, but he doesn't. For him, it's proved impossible to cite what he's collected as a singular impression, as a summary dissemblance, without the sense of passing into typic pose. He remembers only that which is inestimably long ago, for the fact that if the estimate were obvious to him, and that is all that means, he thinks, that viscerous alterity of cherished modes, of modes held dear, then he'd recall the figure of such gustatory ignis whenever it had slithered into happenstance, so had at some present time appeared. All this to elucidate his wholly novel status, his displacement from the outside of the inside of the view. A posture unexampled to the auditors of fortune as their passing, as they saunter quickly past his septic cipher of a seal. 
he is as yet none other than another, than no other other ought, not only as an other, but as all others, as every other ever ought to be. That some are is, as others ought, is not his pressing problem, but of him, but for him, enough. He's had enough. But such conditional satiety won't dissuade him from returning to a moment from which he'll soon forevermore depart, when once again the burden of a passing fancy passes into dilatory savor, the radiance coerce a squint from convalescent pupils, and the heat upon his neck impel the sweat to start. He can still recall that day as clearly as, as clear as this one, but he can see it clearer. It's not that it's more proximate, but that it's limbed in greater detail as a spotlight can illumine in an instant what's been hidden from the easy eye for centuries. When was it, he wonders. No, that's not the crucial question, not the right question, he's sure. Even he, despite his longings, will not foist upon his subjects the vexation of such trivial concerns. Or perhaps that's not the reason. Rather, 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 rather than perhaps. He is yet rather incapable of saying, of deducing when it was that he was last, perhaps still first, but surely last, when he was last afflicted with that menacing exigency, that cavalcade of poses that his plethora implies. It would be foolish to assume the contradiction has escaped him, that such contraction of cross-purposes, cross-explanations, he believes, as though he might esteem his dreaming motive into some triumphant portrait of conditions not just borne out, but derived, could slip by without notice, not by tongue or affectation, but by being likewise thrust into an unshared world. It would be foolish, he accepts, and while such foolishness won't push his expedition into shipwreck, he feels it as a shot across the prow. And neither is his pleasure what excites such restive purpose, what instigates his suppliance to such a feckless trove. No pleasure, really. He confesses to no pleasure in the pleasing, but in his image of the being pleased. He has this once remembered, has suggested to his altar, if only just this moment having first inferred its gaze, that his facile acquiescence to this inchoate adventure may be twofold, but in each case feigns the one, the singular surrender to. Need he go no further? No, that's still not it, he thinks, not as it's most liable to engender such resolve. Need he make it clearer, more like such a one would fairly suffer in return? It's always been a posture of passivity he's after, a threshold of receivership he ambles ever towards. Need such a hapless satiety go anywhere, he wonders? No. There is no need, it goes without saying, there is no need to say it, but what's more, one need not say, one need not say, he can't help but remember, a fact that won't prevent him from attending to that standard for the equally impertinent but no less circumstantial does not ever thus preventing prevent him from the saying for the exploit of disclosing that what needs be said is nothing. Nothing like what is said, which is always as a surfeit, the always more than nothing that this symbol of an absence makes intrinsic, makes a predicate, the vessel that each more than merely nothing serves to fill. He has unconcealed a twofold explanation for his rancor, his subtle divagation as a parenthetic pause. He has recalled that at his earliest awareness of the sun upon his shoulder, his neck, his back, 
the back of his neck and the front of his shoulder is felt through spreading gelatin of grimy frock of molting peel. That the advent of the shine through that imperious edema stirred him from his resting place to seek out some relief. To seek an ease from what had seemed a visceral distemper accorded by the fevered cusp of spitting lips of guts clenched tight. So which is it, he wonders, which point for the pointer, for the pointer to point to as his foundling husk, his ported shell? It is easy enough to accept the occasional coincidence of sun and seizure without designating primacy of stimulus or cause, but it is just as easy to deem either the occasion the placeholder of a world expelled from aspiration or expectancy, a world that's been unyieldingly, interminably deferred. Deferred to present circumstance, that is. That is the presence. Deferred to present circumstance, that then of spendthrift splendor, both writ across his rictus and the visard of the star, was made at last at least to seem an equal approbation for this consummate remainder, this submission to an otherwise importunate regard. Just who's being importuned, who being importuned, One thinks of every circumstance as serving some base ego, some target of intention that is consummately in, which is to say, not out. He thinks of every mover as a personhood, an agent, whereas the seeming obverse is not graced with such resort. Not every fitful anima is likewise capable of movement, but in this case, both coincident conditions, the fever that ingeminates the out that mirrors in, and the in that takes the mood of every out to be its own, are identically engrossing, and together serve as setting for this portent of a finished tale. Or that one, he thinks. That one that he thinks of, and not in. And so it was that when the sun was last lit blear and bold, when last his weary rapture hit that muzzle of a gloam, and not because of, not by virtue, he slackens and he hesitates. He fractures every fractured stone, and there, just there, he seizes on an inkling of some next propitious advent, a supplicant's peremptory refrain. He recalls that pulsing plenitude because it was quite blinding, because that gasping vault was so discordantly ablaze, but that's not why he's stumbled into that same recollection, why he can't seem to stop himself from yielding to this swoon. For that he has himself to blame, in that he finds his witness. But that's not it at all, he thinks. That's not his it at all. Or while that's not not it at all, that's still not it. And it's always just the shibboleth of this perplexed anaphora he's after. That it. This that. That this it. What matters is, what is the matter is, that is, is that that once, that once before, that at least once before, he left his bulwark unattended, precisely as he had at some pass prior to this last return. And that time, while perhaps still, excuse me, or perhaps still something less than, or is it more, either more or less than singular in occurrence, not unique, that is to say, in his typology of forms, is nonetheless the only instant, the one instance of abandon he can actually remember or in what he imagines as a present tense recall. That one last time the sun was out and inside he could feel his bloat amount to an exigency, a want he is convinced that no consumer of like character can fail to fully slake without, without at once erupting in the strain of abnegation, without discreetly bursting, 
before the next pass through. He knows this is a commonplace in his life as all others. He knows that recollecting just this instance is inane. What matters is that in his view, the present scene is singular, and that not for the reference to his past evacuations, but the length of time it took him to retreat to place and prime. That in all other incidents of leaving off by leaving place, his leaving had no consequence, achieved no signal enemy, thus adduced neither discomfort nor ensuing palliation to a portion with a logic or a cause. That he can recollect only one previous occurrence of the kind might prove a fault in his analysis, but it's a point of scant relation to what concerns his, what concerns him here and now, which is the understanding, the drawing out of what in substance, substance made his stray from course result in such ponderous dudgeon in refractory replacement, a change in state accepted, if in any tense endured, if revealed at any moment that's conceived of as at present, as having been or soon to be described in present term. To catch the nervy beast, one must not spring out at a distance. What makes such recall apropos, thus different from all others, from that of any other other next to or to come, is that he has it, and so can give a shape to that lost movement in the now. This is not to say that what on this deferred occasion has exceeded to the mind's eye, or even on that very same occasion this occasion here evokes, is what there was, is exactly what there was when it was there, there on the outside, but only that such aggregate bears some obscure proximity to what he thinks there is or was, there was or is. Perhaps it is a kind of saying, a modulation of no small consequence, Perhaps he is saying to himself what he believes does not corroborate such cursory, such uniform reversion to some singular momentum neither distant now nor near, as refuse bobbing on the waves that catches the regard of idle gazers so that following the speed of what had once appeared the chaos of the deluge reads as stagnant in relation to the moving shore." He is saying to himself that thus distinguishing the torrent, thereby bringing it to stasis, if not keeping it in view, does not confirm, should not betoken the singularity of anything but a detail in the bracket of attention, where before, where before that there was no such, there was none. There have been times, he thinks, he, and he thinks it with a confidence unsourced in evidentiary display. There have been times, he knows, not knowing any reason he should know them so. There have been times before this insurmountable regression, the times when he had left his harbor just as nonchalantly, though only one such previous example leaps to mind, and that it seems assured is only sure on this occasion for the preternatural deference to some other sort of praxis, or perhaps of the same sort, but in some future sort of mull, when his quantum discomposure will, with similar imperative, require him to quit his place and so relieve his bloat. There is no such directory he'd like to now endeavor that he'd ever like to now pursue as any patent end. And for this, no pursuer would be less likely to thank him if he could, in the midst of his habitual aversion, keep control over the impulse to do as he would want to now avoid. It can't be much of a surprise that one so full of virtue so wholly virtuous, he thinks, as though he need remind himself, would conscientiously distrust the capricious pulse of longing, 
and in order to ensure he doesn't rashly follow whimsy in the face of this predicament, that he won't fail to understand what led him lurching lengthwise into this most thrilling spate, he's inclined to purpose forward towards his full disinclination, an easement somehow palpably, intractably his own. Thank you. Our next reader will be Alan Felsenthal. Alan Felsenthal runs a small press called The Song Cave with Ben Estes. Also with Estes, he edited a dark dream box of another kind, the poems of Alfred Starr Hamilton, published in 2013. Felsenthal's writing has appeared in Bomb, The Brooklyn Rail, Critical Quarterly, Fence, Jubilat, and Harper's. Lowly, published by Ugly Duckling Press in 2017, is his first collection of poems. Alan Felsenthal has been a force on the poetry publishing scene for years. The, publishing, the publication last year of his debut collection, Lowly, focused attention on his talents as a poet. Some of his poems wander down the page, informally miming prose structures then suddenly posting an unexpected answer to an unasked question. His images have multiple ramifications, making the poems feel sometimes like psalms. There's a prayer-like quality to these poems. Other poems have a more chiseled quality, as though they had been carved in stone outside temple precincts. There's a metaphysical aspect to Felsenthal's poems they cannot quite be parsed. The body is also a major factor in the equation, but the, physical, but the physical metaphysical relation is not solved for us by the poet. Here's his poem, Beginning with a Horse, in its entirety. A horse has six legs. Two belong to a man who might be Pluto, disguised as the devil abducting a unicorn whose horn was used to purify a spring that wedded the infinite now behind us. Reading this poem aloud, I'm reminded how important the line is in some of Felsenthal's poems. It functions almost like a refrain, a rhythmic plaint that somehow speaks to the difficulty of existing in a body in an unfathomable un universe. A recent poem, which I hope he'll read tonight, reminds us, you belong to your times, but above, commit to spirit, yours. Please welcome Alan Felsenthal. Thank you, Vincent. That was a beautiful introduction, and thank you for inviting me. And it's good to read with you, Steve, and thank you, Megan. Um, now I am going to read, I, I will read that poem. <laughs> I'm going to read some poems from Lowly and then some new poems too. This is called Two Martyrs. Two martyrs stalked the earth, almsgiving equally, so neither knew the other was capable of competition until the first martyr sacrificed his life before the township by jumping into a fire pit. Some said the second martyr, inspired by his friend's decision, faced the pit and lit himself on fire. After the first martyr saw this act, he was immediately resurrected, only to end his life once more by lighting his body on fire, then jumping from the tower. The town gasped as suddenly the second martyr reappeared afire and shaking the tower until its shattered stones covered him. This cycle of sacrifice went on so long the two turned into an attraction for travelers. Soon they were no longer considered martyrs, but brothers whose punishment for misusing fire was to continue misusing it.
And this is the poem that Vincent mentioned. It's called The Hawk at Washington Square Park. So it's a New York poem. Set on a wire on a breezeless day, so still his frame was a figurine, wordless. People, eyes on each other, pass. Calm, the majestic sentinel sits slightly above our bitterness, his body its own crutch. He is proving the true nature of his greatness by being ignored, as if saying impassively, be noiseless, unseen, not behind or under us, you belong to your times, but above, commit to spirit, yours, and then a gentle wind comes. Um, so this poem, it's okay to laugh at even though it's a very unpleasant subject. And there's a cameo by a friend of mine, the poet Amanda Nadelberg, so I'm reading this for her. It's called My Domestic Poem. The remedy for your ruminations is bed bugs. When you, are, when you acquire bed bugs, you are blessed, for you only have one problem, like when you're addicted to drugs. When you're addicted to drugs, your problem is being addicted to drugs. And bed bugs, like drugs, divide your life. You are thinking of them when you're not thinking of yourself. Thinking of yourself leads to rumination, your reaction to distress involving bed bugs. Look upon your life as not bare when you consider theories. You do not live a bare life, one without rights. An exception, the bed bug is a daemon, a nymph sent like a dream to connect you to a history of visual communication. For we understand as much about invisibility as we do DSL technology. The shadow of the bed bug remains on your sheets when they are white, like calligraphy from other worlds, ideograms writ in shit instead of clay, which seem to convey that bed bugs, like Sumerians, are responsible for one of the earliest systems of writing. A bed bug smashed on its mattress signs its will in your blood, the way they did centuries ago, with the limbs of kings and gods who took the form of human beggars, beggars who did not own freezers, like mine, filled with clothing removed when I got home from the movies. I shook my pants over the bathtub, then folded, I slid them between my jacket and shirt where, if I had any, ice cream should be. Amanda asked me to write this poem. She said, write about something you do every day, something domestic. I go to the grocery store when I can't make eggs with what's in the fridge, but I fill my freezer with clothing as often as I leave the apartment. My right. I signed a contract with life that states a chair covered in fabric is a divine throne of the city you visit when sitting down. And when you go, you leave with an echo of that seat. Once I brought a bed bug home. The proportion of its body to mine was nothing compared to its power upon my thoughts. They use the stars and clouds and wind to guide their way into your mind. When you Google what does a bed bug look like pictures, you are not Googling yourself. In an image, the brown back of a fifth stage nymph shines like a mushroom intoxicated by the effulgence of wet dirt. Is mud the timetable of blood? Mud is the roof of the underworld. The underworld's unpeopled palace is colder than I thought, but nothing wretched belongs there. If nothing is wretched, thoughts misled me with my permission. The bed bug is where it belongs. A body was built to be vanquished. Trust the lovers of beds and bodies. We hardly know whom we've slept with. Somewhere else a mosquito survives August by killing a child who just learned cursive. They don't teach cursive anymore. The coldest moment of mourning is when I put on my jeans especially my thumb touching the button. During that ecstatic instant, looking at its imprint on the frost, I think only of usefulness. I hope none of you ever have to experience dead bugs. <laughs> and some new ones. This is called The Borderland of Vision. 
A seven-headed serpent sent to swallow the world slinks beneath an angel to witness the ascension of a small bug from earth who owned nothing but a small hard shell so light it could fit into the hand as a pick that strums to the song the angelic choir sings to my unborn son at night. This is from my partner, Will, called Open Openly. Blessed Tuesday, blessed Monday. Bless the word week, its seven small days trail with why. Bless the men whose words I was too young to hear. A whisper loves a canal. Bless my laugh, lent by grief. I have so little left to borrow. But my hair, it grows. If hair be gold, cut mine so I might rid my beloved of his student loans. Bless thieves, universities. Those hands caress what's not theirs. Bless thinking it was yours. Here are hands, blessed one. Bless them holding the door. Bless each crier on the F train before and after me as they blush, as they transfer into tunnels for the red line. Oh, bless, bless wildly what remains to be done. Bless the one who told me so, the ones who didn't. Even weak breaths bless. Bless weakness, fragile fortress, my friend's body absent of soundness. Bless sound of someone reliable answering your call, saying, if you're going through hell, hello, hello. Bless being able to respond when a loved one asks, can you tell I'm miserable? I can hear it, elastic sadness, distinctive as a summons, appear and pronounce. Bless you, my beloved, coming, leaving, staying a while the tone of being unharmed, deep as a sound sleep. Bless the channel between us, your tiny boat, your body in a body of water that connects to larger bodies. Bless these sensations when lost, hear a tender voice. This is called Sound Like the Person You Are. Yes, but will it defrost their hearts so they can use them as windshields? Poet, be the appalled. Heroes with expiration dates make fraudulence visible, but they're still our heroes? Not loosen, but melt. Soul death has proven non-fatal, ugh. Recall the body, this one stinks. A soul smells dandelion, golden whispers of the sun's children. To whisper a hymn improves soul density. A soul, I'd walk freely up the mountain and on its peak, release my anatomy. It's a long lunge down, but I don't own this belly. The reason I ask is because they're cold. A veil of ice pleads to be thawed inside them. The freeze is complete, though the heart's a thief of blood. I can be accused of misusing the word soul through repetition, the body, its clumsy shroud. No one goes to hell for public drunkenness. They stay panhandling for mercy and make loneliness a soul's tongue. So lonely, even a friend won't do. Feeling is a cliff or pirate ship I hid from, though I ache to be helpful, like a woolen fleece, too tiny to keep you warm. Little water break. This is called Past Life Palinode. A field theory sings its song in the solid sphere of an astrolabe in the ancient tooth fished from an inlet, 
In my great-grandfather's Islamic proto-clock with the dials of the sun and moon. When I remembered the sun was born, I forgot the name of an old woman I used to visit on Sundays. My memories are unrelenting, not rational, but I grew up in a cult of personalization. An all-embracing sea is reluctant to give up the dead, centuries of wayward ships and mothers lost in transit. I suppose all the tabletop paintings of Jerusalem are underwater where there is no night, but eternal night. I wander a masculine form for the half-feminine Lord who knows no last judgment. It's a double lion, a snake circling itself, a new sun setting on the God who eats his children. Harriet was her name. I was too afraid to call the hospice when I moved. Matter danced with glory, and inside my claw, I held some precious sand. A snake sees the world in hourglasses on the way to a sacrificial meal for two. If Oceanos ever ate dinner, he ate the snake souls after slaying his friend, the bull. I'm not expecting to become the gatekeeper of these mysteries. I only want time to read, to feel a story well, stare at my beloved, and make of all my discomfort a household shrine. A water clock, too, has moods of love. The hands of little girls pour water from above. The music of time is measured in combustible powder during a long shower with a man you come to love. The burning of it might be a model of creation and, like regret, irreversible. I only want to know enough of the zodiac to stay away from Berlin. The surface of a primordial ocean hard and pitiless, bubbles with the ionic life of a god. The son of a sun god, was his shadow gold? Became identical to his father. They held the thigh of a slain bull over their heads until a sun disk, it rose a bone to the horizon. This was high summer in Leo. Blood dried as it dripped the moment I figured out the sun gives gifts that include illness. I was placed as a gnomon in the field and stood until I finally felt. I desired to cry for the right reasons. To concentrate, I tried Saturn, the slowest visible planet, rules the boundaries, the god of the sick, crippled and creative, basically the lives of saints. I never knew much about her life before I visited, and now we have a chemistry of symbols. As ghosts do, she asks, who are you? When she asks, I'm a stranger who edits the rhyme dirty jokes of the Middle Ages for my imagined little sister. If it ends our own time in general cataclysm, if the rain on the right strives to be the sun, if no brazen serpent on a rod ever hisses again, well, I want it to be more than a breathing clock, not the tones of eternity, the small dance of a worm whose moves hollow out a hazelnut. So my steps form dreams for the children I won't have to give to each other. My wife swings on the arc of a cycloid and my husband, after playing Skittles on a fairy hill of giants, comes home an old man. It's night. The trenches are filled with mysterious freezes of light. I thought I had been here already in my emotion time diagram, in my field work, in the letters I wrote and carried through the circular river of the underworld, with my suave mind awaking to life's errors, a garbled painting, a painting in which what is whispered is garbled, is the providence of irreversible existence. Time's triads touch the soul as the thread of life caught our ankles. I ran away. Hurts less to speak in living images, to look at the sphinx and think of the sun strangling the sky to leave the royal tomb unguarded for an hour, to tinge gold coins with river. Like Hesiod said, the hours are God, are the hours are gods, more here than the kingdom of dwarfs, the hours barbers of Amaryllis and Queen Anne's lace, flowers from an Alice Notley poem. I was working for poetry when I first noticed how ordinary time is perishable. How did A, B, C, D, and I appear at the same place at once? 
I almost believe I could die in a war on the table of Solomon. I'm tired of tricks. The sundial in the garden is either a stylized tree or spinal cord of a sun god. A spiral petroglyph dreams of snakes, it sheds skin, imagines birth. What I disown owns me. Time, the hermit hunched to turn his hourglass, mine, and the blindfold I wore to decide whether I could live the sensual life. One century sees in a blindfold justice, the next ignorance. The same painting glistens like a lantern waving level to your eyes. Saturn has no telephone. Calls from the desert to say the sun lives. Time is okay now. Somehow contemplation repairs you. I tried to repeat great, 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 and then tired of great, great, great. A god wafted its name amidst. I heard preserve the space between letters for the fertile exclusion of sense. Last weekend I stayed home but denied village life. Rejected the details of a household shrine, of Egyptian papyrus with two lions who supported the newborn sun god, who withers plants without deep roots, offers a double stance of dedication more active than my own. To say each day we are given a new god increases blasphemy, though it also can be helpful. I volunteered to watch old women sleep among flowers. I slept curled at the foot of their obelisks. I volunteered, so I guess I don't work here. Jean-Luc Godard said the money, meaning the time, meaning having the money and being able to spend it according to one's rhythm and one's pleasure, to languish unhumiliated, a victory. The stars care less about their viewers than the drone operators theirs, but looking obeys desire, hope that one more thing might exist than 10,000 with earthly time to see. The garbled voice of the animal from the painting tells of divine time, like a pearl beginning in the dragon's mouth, drowned on its way to America. Time was born in time, for time exists if America is not the soul wherein a god is born. At the US Postal Service, I saw the forms of time give rise to human venom and flux like the flow of grains. A man yelling at a woman about his insights into labor he said, we all work for the city, as though the city were a lotus or water lily giving God's life, an umble for order. I had a thought from China in which upon uniting two opposite desires, an extra temporal Godhead blowing salt into a void births the stillness in which everything happens in one single synchronous time to be recorded years from now on the badge of an emperor's surcoat. I dipped my finger in the sticks and, spoiler alert, I don't understand love. If matter explodes to no heat death, all sight is circles and clocks and no love lives in the heavens, or love is created, destroyed with no beginning or end, well, instead we can focus on the light clock of Alyasari, which burned for 13 hours. A penny weight fell each hour from within the candle to touch the figure who trimmed the wick out by the time you slept. The velocity of sleep is Einstein's theory. It's like this. The temporal indication of love is relative to the position of an observer watching her beloved sleep. Careful where you aim your intensity. When the moon in demon hands is closed, they strike their pots and pans to distract the demon. The moon makes music through the fears of my neighbors. A pot, a pan, the ancient hand of music in an orb. If the lecherous wind has made us sick, the moon will have its day. The magic mirrors of Pythagoras measure the moon in the breath of my beloved. The moon lives as long as metaphor. Looking east in a mirror, I viewed myself as a harmonious snake. I sailed the boat of Ray on deck I walked a circle of archetypes. My soul sat sweetly in the soft stern. The boat of Ray, it sails above and below the internet. The boat which is a scepter, which is a key the keeper of a gate sails into summer with. The god of light, who bleeds helium, 
whose sadness drips along the metal rods peasants held to light new torches. That god, living in a strobe, meant the majesty of night was ours to see as we wanted. Outside of books is not what we couldn't imagine. The world soul is not looking for us, for the world soul needs no fame. Celebrity is the prayer of capital. I was born under a falciform moon, sickle-shaped, and a stupor like a demon makes me say the opposite of what I feel. Keep your chart to yourself. It's like giving away your last four digits. Under the aromatic stones near the delta, I wrote sentences with branches I threw into the river wending to a sea. Quietness failed, and so I chose words. Dear Sphinx, will this be my last bed before the final visages I know sink into the heavens? I hope to clearly say without riddles, riddles of riddles, how it felt to live. Between ego time and eonic time on the way to the timeless center, I write a slow-moving ibex with fiery eyes, mine, not his. Fortuna shakes with monochromatic hands, our peacock ethics won't be seen. For where she's expected, in total blindness, in the center of a wheel, is nothing. But that nothing rotates like nothing else. I'll write to you from there. Thank you.